Good morning. Our first scripture reading today is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 28. This ancient hymn to Christ gives assurance of reconciliation through him. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things and in all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself in all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death. And so, as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, and that is the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me and to you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and the generations but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope and the glory. It is he who we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may be present to every mature person in Christ.
In our gospel reading today, Jesus finds that Martha and her sister Mary have different priorities in their life. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Well, good morning. Yeah, it is great to be with you today. Um, I am here, I think you know, because Janet and Nick and so many others from the community uh, of faith known as the disciples, Christian disciples, that's you, right, um, are, are in a place, an exotic place <laughs> called Des Moines. And I was uh, talking with, I think it was Frank, or did you go Frank? Yeah, Frank and his wife, were, we were talking about going to Des Moines and, and how important it was that, that the, somebody alert the police uh, that the Christian disciples were in town. And, and yes, because um, Mrs. Fay, right? said something to the words of the effect, yeah, because there's going to be a lot of kind people running around the streets of Des Moines. So, uh, that's, that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm trying to be kind, uh, and, and uh, I'm really honored to be asked. Janet is such a good colleague of mine uh, in ministry here in this community, um, and I'm thankful for colleagues in ministry at the work of the council, one of which is here with us today. Uh, Chief Development Officer Christine Moses is over there, and I've got with me in my hand a, a reminder card that I, uh, we've sent this out to our member churches. South Street got one of these, I'm pretty sure, along with some peanuts and, and maybe some candy corn. We were thinking about fall already because this is a reminder about September the 26th when we're going to gather together uh, for our annual Celebrate Compassion Dinner. And we're going to celebrate the compassion of our member churches and the members in those churches that are volunteering with the work of the council, places like Cross Lines and Safe to Sleep. Um, and so we are excited about this. This is our 50th anniversary, uh, 2019. Uh, it was 50 years ago that Dorsey Level and um, a few other key clergy and leadership in the community came together to form the Council of Churches of the Ozarks. So we're pretty excited about this year. By the way, tomorrow is Dorsey Level's birthday. Uh, you were celebrating birthdays earlier. Tomorrow's Dorsey's birthday. I believe he's going to be 85. And so we're excited about that uh, this year. Um, and I'm reminded, too, that 50 years ago, um, many of you have been seeing news reports about the moon landing. And some of you are older, old enough to remember uh, the moon landing. Um, it's one of the most unifying uh, experiences for all of humanity, uh, as it turns out. Uh, more people watched uh, that moon landing than any televised event up to that time in the whole world. And so, um, and that's kind of the message I think that we can lift up today from the readings. Um, I want to um, uh, kind of focus there, and, and by the way, I, I was asked to, I hope I'm not breaking any rules today. I, uh, Janet, did ask me when she called and, and she's, well, I asked her actually. I said, so Janet, is it a, a custom to wear a robe uh, while I preach? And she said, well, if you want to, you can. And, and I said, well, if I don't want to, I don't have to then, right? And she said, no, you don't have to. And so, and so I'm, I'm glad Steve is wearing the robe today. Uh, we call those paraments, by the way, right? The robe and the, the stole and all that. So in honor of one of my favorite theologians, uh, Mr. Rogers, um, I, I wore my Mr. Rogers socks today. So these are, these are my paraments that I'm wearing today. Um, 
I, I, I love what Mr. Rogers has to say about so many different things, but one of the things uh, he writes in this little book, uh, The World According to Mr. Rogers, he says, the more I think about it, the more I wonder if God and neighbor are somehow one. Loving God, loving neighbor, the same thing? For me, coming to recognize that God loves every neighbor is the ultimate appreciation. And I loved how, Steve, at the um, communion table this morning, you said, this is the Lord's table. Everyone is welcome. And my guess is that you say that every Sunday, right? Pretty much, right? Those are institu words of institution that sort of lay the ground, right, for what it means to be uh, a person of faith in this community of faith. This is the Lord's table. Everyone is welcome. Right? And I get that sense of uh, some in the readings today, especially uh, that, that reading from Colossians. Did you hear that reading this morning? Isn't that something about uh, this, this big vision that Paul is describing, um, that all things are in Christ, and Christ is in all things, and all things hold together in him. Wow. You see, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's not Jesus' last name. Christ is this all-encompassing vision of all of reality. Pierre de Chardin, a paleontologist, a Roman Catholic, uh, put it this way. He said that the physical structure of the universe, the physical structure of the universe is love. That's a kind of a bold statement for a scientist to make, right? The physical structure of the universe is love. And he's talking about Christ. That this is the, the world we live in, that the reality that we live in is interconnected, and it frankly is all one. All interconnected, all one. Everyone is welcome at the table. See, that's really the work of the Council of Churches, I believe. See, we get caught up in, in some ways in these differences between faith and works. You know, is it, is it more faith and less works, or is it more works and less faith? Well, um, that's kind of what's happening with Martha and Mary this morning in the reading. In, in the world of the Council of Churches, we, we kind of advance the work of the Council on two tracks. Uh, one track is Matthew 25. Remember that text where Jesus says, I, I was hungry and you, you fed me. Yeah. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was sick, and you visited me. Yeah. By the way, thank you for finishing those lines. Uh, I think that's part of what it means to be in a community where we know the story so well that sometimes those of us who might forget it have a, a voice coming alongside us to remind us that's how that story goes, right? Yeah. Matthew 25. That, that compelling vision, that not just identification with the suffering and the poor, but the actual embodiment. And this is what Paul says in today's reading. Christ in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. And, and that identification of God, and not just identification, but the, um, I'll use a big theological word on you, I, got, I had to pay big money to go to seminary to get these words, okay? But the ontological existence of God in you. That's what Matthew 25 is about. I was hungry and you fed me. God is alive and well among us. And somehow, some way, I don't know fully why, but somehow God loves to hide among the suffering among those who are hurting, among those who feel forgotten, among those who are crying out to God. God seems to want to come alongside those especially. Yeah. 
So that track, Matthew 25, is one of them. The other track is John 17, where Jesus is praying. He's praying for us. He prays for the disciples, but he also prays for us. And he says, Father, may they be one as you and I are one so that the world will believe that you sent me. See, I I don't know. I, I have no idea what Jesus was talking about when he walked into Martha and Mary's house that day. But I I can't help think that maybe he was talking about that Samaritan story. You see, that's the reading that precedes this story in Luke's gospel. Check it out. Earlier in in Luke chapter 10, uh, Jesus gets this question from a a lawyer, of all people, okay, (laughs) Um, who wants to know, uh, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Luke says he said that to sort of justify himself. He wants to kind of feel good about himself. And don't we all? Okay, let's just pause there. Don't we all? I mean, even, even, even Martha in this story, she's doing her duty, right? I mean, this is what's expected of her uh, as the woman of the house to care for people in the house. Um, but what was, what was it the story that Jesus, maybe, I can't help but think that maybe there was a buzz happening about Jesus and this whole thing about the Samaritan who came alongside that man who was robbed and beaten up on the Jericho Road. Right? Remember the story? The Levite, the, the, you know, the really important um, sort of uh, got my act together Jewish guy saw the man who was beaten up and robbed, but he passed on by. Jesus told the story, right? And so did the priest, the other guy who had his religious act together, you know, felt pretty good about himself and didn't want to stain his hands by touching somebody who was beaten up and bleeding on the road. But here comes the Samaritan. And guess who that Samaritan is? According to the Jewish people at that time, ah, don't even look at them. They're those people. They're not welcome at the table. But Jesus gets their attention with that story. And, and I can't help but think everybody's buzzing about that. Are you kidding me? And I can't help but think that maybe, this is my own theological imagination, forgive me if I've, you know, if you, if you can... Think of me as a heretic if you want. That's okay. I can live with that. But here, I can imagine Mary. Maybe she was at the marketplace and she saw maybe this Samaritan person. Maybe it was a man. Maybe it was a woman. But something about their face got her attention. And there's this buzz happening in the house And Mary can't help herself but want to sit down and listen to what's happening. And she's captivated in her listening. By the way, I I just want to say to you, um, one of the things that I've come to appreciate about um, doing what I do is I, I, I think that's what they pay me to do is listen. I, I kind of get that feeling, not just to, to the people that work with me, but to the people in our community. And sometimes I'm good at my job, and frankly, sometimes I'm not. But, but my, my sense is, and this is the, the listening practice that I get every two weeks, I sit together with about seven other men, and we break the rules. Men are not supposed to do this, by the way. <laughs> We're not supposed to sit and listen to each other and not interrupt each other and try to fix each other. See, the rules are you you kind of tell other people what they're supposed to think and do. But no, we don't do that. We create a safe space for each other to say what is in our souls and on our minds and in our hearts uninterrupted. And we can take as long as we need to take and listen to each other. And Steve, I'm telling you, it's almost exactly like that. 
where there is a union and a communion that takes place among these men. And men, I want to encourage you to think about that, to find space in your life to listen to each other. So I think our world needs more of it. But at any rate, this is, uh, this is kind of the, what's happening, I think, in that context in the home. And here's Martha. Oh, Martha. And, I, and the reading suggests to me, oh, this agony about Martha. And it's almost, you know, don't you care? Don't you care? I, I've said that before. <laughs> I've said those words before to God as if God did not know what was happening in my life. Don't you care? Ugh. And Jesus, there's love just dripping on his lips. Martha. Martha. Mm. I wish you could see things the way I do. Maybe, maybe you can. Because you can choose, Martha. Martha. You can choose that faith and works, that your sister Mary has chosen this one thing, this beautiful thing, to lean in and listen to what's happening in her own life. You can listen. It can all be together and as one, the way breathing, both inhaling and exhaling, are one. You can choose to see them as one the way life and death are both one and they embody one reality. So we're offered a question, I think, from this story. I'll close with this. We're offered a question, can we see beyond our own needs to be obeying the rules, the expectations, the demands, the pressures that are put on us, and just stop and listen? Can I listen long enough to get beyond the comfort I find in comparing and competing and accept the essential oneness of all things and be a part of that oneness? That Christ is in all things, on heaven, in heaven and on earth, and that they were created for him things visible and invisible, as Paul says, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, that all things have been created through Christ and for Christ, and that Christ himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things hold together. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, God's people said,